Good afternoon, morning, or evening, people, and welcome to Marketing Research. My name is Paul Tilley, and today we're going to be discussing questionnaires and questionnaire design. So far in the course, we've done a lot of work with regards to secondary data and primary data and the theory surrounding all of those things. At this stage in the course, we're going to be looking at the actual collection of data using questionnaires and the actual processes involved in measuring people's attitudes and thoughts. In this first section, we're going to be looking at some of the terminology as much as anything involved in questionnaires and being able to measure things using questionnaires. First, we're going to be looking at what it is that needs to be measured and how that actual measurement takes place. One of the ways that it takes place is using various scales and scaling systems, so we'll be looking at measurement scales. We're going to also look at some of the criteria that's important for good measurement. And we're going to discuss how consumer attitudes are measured. Attitudes need to be measured indirectly, and using some of the tools that we've learned about, we could be able to do that. We're going to discuss the various types of rating scales and the merits of each rating scale. And we're going to explain the importance of basic questionnaire design. We're also going to discuss and explain some of the basic types of questions asked in questionnaires and the basic activities involved in questionnaire design and delivery. Finally, we're actually going to look at the actual making of a questionnaire, how it's done, what's required in order to make it most effective. So, stay tuned. Let's take a look at questionnaire design. First, we need to look at some of the definitions of terminology that we'll be using in questionnaire design. The first is the issue of measurement. Measurement, formally, is the process of describing some property or phenomena, usually by assigning some number to it. And in a, we do it in such a, a way that it becomes reliable and valid in terms of measurement. The numbers convey important information about the phenomena. So it's important that we can convert things to number, and that those numbers mean something. Next, we look at the concept of a concept. What is a concept? Well, a concept, for the purposes of marketing research, is a generalized idea about a class of objects, attributes, occurrences, or processes that represent something of an identifiable and distinct meaning. So essentially, a concept is a frame of reference that not only you can understand, but everybody can understand. So we have to explain basic concepts or describe certain concepts so that it has a broad-based meaning. We also have to know what an operational definition is. An operational definition by definition, is a researcher's measure of concepts through a process. And that process is known as operationalizing. So this, I would suggest, is taking the concept and making it real. How do we make it real? Operational definitions specify what the researcher must do to measure the concept under investigation. So it lays out the process. We also look at the concept of variables. Variables are what research used to measure things. So researchers use the variance of concepts to help make meaningful diagnosis of a certain situation. And variables capture different values and have different meanings in concepts. But it's important that we measure the variables, the variables and understand what the variation means and how important is that variation. Finally, we look at the issue of a construct. A construct is a number of variables that are measured to have some sort of meaning. So, it's a term used with multiple variables, meaning that we're collecting a whole bunch of information. And what we need to be able to do is take all of those various various variables that we measure. For example, we might want to test a car. We're going to test things like its fuel mileage, its, uh, its acceleration, its horsepower. All of those individual things together create what we call a construct that can tell us about the car. First major issue that we need to look at within this chapter is the issue of measurement and how things are measured. 
And in terms of measuring, we need to have some sort of a scale. And we're going to look at really four different types of scales that are used. First, we're going to look at nominal scales. Nominal scales are a measurement of a name. It is nothing more than giving something a name. For example, a star player would have a number on his or her jersey. That jersey would represent something. Let's take a look at Sid the Kid Cosby. Sid Crosby is number 87. I think it was the year he was born. Or, if you're older like me, or much older than me, the famous Rocket Richard. He was number 9. Any of you who are familiar with the, the famous Canadian story, and if you got a $5 bill, you look on the back, you'll see that famous Canadian story of the hockey sweater. We all know that Maurice Richard was number 9. Well, that is a nominal measure, meaning that the number doesn't really mean anything other than act as an identifier, be it Sidney Crosby's 87 or Rocket Wishard's number 9. The scale is the ordinal scale. So an ordinal scale seeks to give something an order, such as first place, second place, or third place. Normally we see ordinal scales used a lot in the racing world. A car comes in, a car race occurs, and we know that someone got first place, the one right behind it got second place, and the third person got third place. We see it in the Olympics, we see it in sports, we see it everywhere. But effectively what an ordinal scale does is it tells the order of which something happened. Nothing more. Just the order. The third type of scale is something called the interval scale. The interval scale builds on top of the ordinal scale by also giving you an order, first, second, and third, as the ordinal scale does, but what it does even further is it takes an idea of the scale of the order. So let's say, for example, first place finisher comes in way ahead of the second place finisher, and the second place finisher comes in just before the third place finisher. So that type of scale uh, uh, would give you something that would say, hmm, I know that first was significantly faster. So, when we look at an interval scale, we could say sometimes, for example, in, a in the case of a car race, that the first car was six car lengths ahead of the second car. And the second and third place finisher were simply a car length apart. This would give us an indication of the scale of which, and the scope of which, that first place won, second place second, and third third. The fourth and most important type of scale is the ratio scale. The ratio scale builds upon the other scales and it brings something to the mix that the other scales just don't have and that is an absolute reference point. So by definition a ratio scale has an absolute zero and using the ratio scale we can refer to one thing relative to something else and that being the absolute. So let's take for example a ruler. A ruler has centimeters or inches that are relative to one another. You can see one inch is smaller than two inch by a scale of two to one, and so on. All measurement really requires two major goals. First of all, the goal of reliability. Reliability refers to the ability of something to do something over and over and over again consistently. Validity is the second type of key thing that we're measuring. And what validity tries to do is to ensure that whatever we're measuring represents the real world. So if we're doing a survey, the survey results need to reflect what the true situation in the world is. We have a little bit of analogy here in this graphic of a dartboard. Let's take a look at different types of dartboards, or dart players, I would suggest. Let's assume, let's start off by imagining playing darts. And imagine that you are throwing darts at a dartboard. Now, those darts land everywhere on the dartboard. They land everywhere. So from one end of the dartboard to the other end of the dartboard, to the middle, to the center, to the outer extremes. We would say that any player who throws darts at a board like that is not very reliable. They're not very reliable at getting a dart in the center of the board, which is the goal of darts. So that really is a, a good indication of low reliability when the numbers are spread all over the place. However, 
if you take a really good dart player, the dart, the really good dart player can generally get the dart in the center of the board most times. That would indicate a very good reliability, very good reliability. So if if you were a good dart player, a dart player, and you come in and you could constantly hit that center area of the board, I would suggest that you are very reliable. No different than a survey. If a survey could give a good indication of what was being measured, if it did indeed measure what it was supposed to be measuring, and it did it consistently all the time, that would be a reliable measure. In terms of validity, we can have reliability without validity. Let's be, for example, a dart player again, and let's be a, a very good poor dart player. It was called a very good do poor dart player. Meaning that I, if, if I'm that very good poor dart player, for example, I can throw darts constantly and miss the board consistently. In fact, I'm so consistent at missing the board that I hit an area up in the top right of the, the corner of the, the board, the backboard, consistently. In this case, I'm very reliable. I constantly miss the board. I'm very reliable. But again, if the goal is to hit the dartboard, in particular the center of the dartboard, I'm not very valid. In other words, I'm not a very good player. Same thing with all kinds of, of statistical measures and questionnaires out there. If we put out a questionnaire, and we get consistent results on the questionnaire, but the results do not give us any indication of the reality. Let's say, for example, if I polled a bunch of students and I asked them what their favorite thing to do in the world is, Okay? I'm sure I would get a consistent result because students tend to be younger, they tend to have different goals and objectives than the rest of the world or the average world. So I would get a good result that would be pretty common amongst most students, no doubt about it. Pretty common. So that would be pretty reliable. You know, the average student, for example. It would be a very reliable measure to tell me what it is you like doing, your favorite things. However, if I were to take that survey and apply it to the rest of the world, let's say for example that students really enjoy partying. Consistently it says that students really enjoy partying. If I say that I take that and I translate it to the world and say the world really enjoys partying, that's probably not a good thing to do. In fact, the results would not be considered as valid to the world because the average older person has probably got more things to do than just party. I'm sure it might be still there as one of the one of the things I like doing, but uh, life has a way of, of changing on you as you move older. And the validity of saying that everybody likes a party is probably just not there for um, for that sort of thing. So it's like throwing the darts at the dartboard, consistently missing the dartboards, but consistently missing in the same place. First, we have to say what exactly is an attitude anyway. Well, an attitude, by definition, is an enduring disposition to consistently respond in a given manner to various aspects of the world. So it's how you perceive things. So your attitude is going to be your perception on the world. And measuring these attitudes is not something we can do directly, but something we need to do indirectly. Attitudes are really measured along three basic terms. And that would be affective terms, cognitive terms, and behavioral terms. In terms of affective measures, what we're doing with affective measures is looking for people's feelings, their emotions towards a given object. So oftentimes we will, in research, measure people's attitudes towards things. How do you feel about this car? What do you think about this is known as the effective domain, and it's a very important one, and a lot of questions in survey research really try to measure the effective domain very well. The next type of domain that we often look at deals with the cognitive, cognitive domain. The cognitive domain really relates to our processing of these things. How is it that we process the information that we get about certain things? So it's our awareness and our knowledge. The focus is on awareness and knowledge. So with awareness and knowledge come the issue of what is it that people believe about things. So how aware are you about it? What do you believe about it? 
What are your thoughts with regards to it? The third type of measure is our behavioral measures. How do we behave? What are the actual actions? And a, a behavior relates to a predisposition to act on certain things, be they cognitive or affective. We also can measure in terms of behavior our intentions. What are our intentions? Do we plan to buy this item? Do we have any insight into, do, do you yield any insight into how greatly you are towards moving towards buying something or doing something, these sorts of things. So that's often measured in here with our behavior. We also need to look at our expectations. What are some of the expectations of people? What do you expect to happen if this happens? So researchers go out and collect data. And the purpose behind the collection of the data is to collect information that can be used in order to help to address the actual marketing research question that's being asked. Now, so far we've talked about attitude and how can we measure attitude, considering that attitude is a very difficult thing to measure. Essentially, attitude can be measured in one of two ways. Physiological measures, such as uh, testing how much you sweat or how your temperature rises or how you become aggravated. Stuff that you can see and measure mechanically. Or, alternatively, we can go out and we can do a, 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 a psychological analysis. And usually when we talk about questionnaires and, and doing research using questionnaires and surveys, we are really looking at that psychological tool as a one that we want to be able to use in order to determine the answers to our questions. So in this section of this unit, we're looking at what are some of the psychological measures or tools that are used in order to assess people's issues and attitudes towards certain things. So over the course of the next few slides, what I wanted to do was to introduce you to some of the some of the measuring tools. First, I want you to look at just basic rating scales that researchers often use. Essentially, there are four basic types of rating scales. First, there is the concept of ranking. Ranking simply puts one, two, three, Four, it orders a bunch of preferences that people may have. So what is the first preference, second preference, third preference, and so on. Alternatively, there is something called a rating scale. And what a rating scale is, it does almost the same thing as ranking, but what it, do, what it does different is it measures the variance between individual ranks. So let's say, for example, a respondent is trying to estimate the magnitude of the difference between their preference for item number one and item number two. Is it this close together or is it that far apart? We want to look at that using some sort of a ranking scale. We also can look at asking the respondent to sort things. So put them in different groups. So how would you sort different issues? So let's say, for example, if you were to think about the top four issues and I ask you a bunch of questions related, I want you to put them in one of those four boxes. So environmental things, for example, would fall in one. Economic things would fall in another, and so on. This is what is known as sorting. We're asking people to sort. Finally, we're looking at a forced choice type system where we ask people to pick between one and another, or one and several, items and ask which one is the most important to you. So the forced choice model forces someone to say, this is my number one. That's really the first issue in the psychological type analysis. The second psychological analysis tool that's often used is something called the use of category scales. In category scales, you'll often find those on questionnaires where people essentially have to answer a multiple choice question. And the multiple choice question could have as few as two possible answers, such as a true-false question is an example of a two-choice, multiple-choice. Or it can have more than two, four, five, six, seven potential alternatives. As we move into the greater number of alternatives, we can 
put a finer point on exactly what someone wants. So a category scale with more than two points is better than one that only has two points to it. So in the example here, we have a, an example of a simple category scale. Do you like pizza? Yes or no? A more complicated or a more intricate category scale in that example would say, how important would the following, was the following be in your decision to visit Clarenville Pizzeria? So you choose one for each other. The location, very important, not very important. Menu options, very important, not very important. Price, very important, not very important. Again, what we're looking at is trying to assess where people were along a continuum of questions. Next, we look at the issue of a Likert scale. A Likert scale is often used as a psychological measure in people's minds, and what it does is it presents five possible options. And the five possible options are very similar in all Likert scale questions. Strongly agree, agree, a middle option of uncertainty, disagree, and strongly disagree. So what we have is a seesaw where you're sitting on one end, which is agree or strongly agree on the far, far end. On the other end would be disagree or strongly disagree on that end, and somewhere in the middle where you neither disagree nor agree. So a Likert scale is a common type of question response that exists on questionnaires. We ask people to kind of pin themselves somewhere along that five-point scale. <clears throat> Likert scales are very, very common, and, and you'll see I have a couple of example slides put up here of a couple of different questions. So uh, it is more fun to play a tough competitive tennis match than to play an easy one. Strongly agree, agree, not sure, disagree, or strongly disagree. This is a form of Likert scale. Another type of scale that is sort of Likert-y, Likert but uh, again offers more points, is something called a semantic differential scale. A semantic differential scale normally has two anchors, one on each extreme, such as excited, calm. And between the two anchors there are seven or so many points, mostly seven, but it could be fewer than that, and it could be more than that. These are just blanks, and what you have to do is select somewhere between one extreme and the other. So semantic differential scales present a series of multi-point bipolar rating scales, and the bipolar adjectives such as good and bad anchor both ends. So this is a useful type of scale in order to get people's thoughts on where they sit on, on a particular issue. Another type of scale is often used as a constant sum scale. Now the constant sum scale, what it does is it gives you 100 points that you can allocate amongst a bunch of considerations. So let's say, for example, divide 100 points among each of the following brands according to your preference for the brand. So brand A, brand B, brand C, and you weight how much you think of a given brand. So for example, the first brand was Kraft, and you were really high, 80. If the second brand was co-op, 10. If the third brand was our compliments, 10. So again, what we're saying there is that the craft brand is significantly more valuable to you, given the 80 points, than the other two brands, which you only only get 10 points each. Now, the constant sum scale is a great scale and allows us to get an idea of magnitude. It is a little more complicated, and if you're dealing with uh, recipients, uh, respondents who may not be all that tuned to math or young or have some inability in mathematics, it's probably not just a good scale because can they add up to 100? That's the basic issue there. So we want to make sure we judge our audience whenever we use that type of scale. We also have something called a graphic rating scale. And the graphic rating scale actually presents pictures, normally pictures of one way or another, that people can select. Now this is really good for young kids, or really good for people who have low literacy levels. So if we had various faces, for example, where you had a happy face, an indifferent face, and a sad face, we could ask a question, what do you think of Sesame Street? And people would select the happy face, the indifferent face, or the sad face. And that would really tell us what their attitude was based on 
their response to that graphic rating scale. We also have another form of testing. Again, it's used somewhat, and again, depending on where it's used and depending on the audience, it's going to make some difference. And that is something called a peer comparison scale. And effectively, what it is in a peer comparison scale, the the respondents are presented with two objects at a time and are asked to pick which one they prefer. So essentially we're forcing choice. Do you like, in this particular answer, would you like, uh, we'd like to know your overall opinion on two brands of bandages, Curad and Band-Aid. What do you figure? Curad is better, Band-Aid is better, or both are the same. So we're asking people to make that choice. And that's a simple example of a, a peer comparison. So those are some key questionnaire type questions that appear that allow us to look at a psychological response to an attitude. Um, I think that that pretty well covers off that first uh, first part of the uh, first part of this unit. Any questions? You let me know.